This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Okay. As they uh, say at Great America, after you ride the demon for the fifth time, welcome back. Uh, okay, it's my great pleasure now to introduce our moderator for the second panel, Felicity Barringer, who has been the uh, national environmental correspondent of the New York Times since November 2003. Previously, Felicity was the United Nations Bureau Chief covering the run-up to the Iraq War in early 2003, and before that, a media reporter and the founding editor of the Monday Business Day section with a special focus on media and technology news. In 1986, after nine years with the Washington Post, she joined the Times as correspondent in Moscow, covering the upheavals of the early Gorbachev era, including the Chernobyl disaster. Uh, Felicity and her husband, Phil Taubman, live in Portola Valley, and uh, Felicity, welcome and thank you for agreeing to moderate this, this panel. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here and uh, good afternoon. I hope everybody got a little bit of sun out there. It's one of those Stanford days that makes you not understand why the East, people on the East Coast stay on the East Coast. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to celebrate the opening of this building, which is a clear indication of Stanford's commitment to cutting back its carbon footprint. It's also a pleasure to be here with four panelists who have a lot of practical experience of what is and is not possible technically, economically, and politically in terms of cutting back the carbon footprints of cities and states. I'm gonna introduce them, then I'm gonna ask each of them to speak for three minutes in response to an opening question. After that, I hope we start messing it up and having a free-for-all and I'll have some questions to try to stimulate that. Larry Goulder, to my left, is the Shuzo Nishihara Professor of Environmental and Resource Economics. And he's a senior fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. And he carries enough other academic titles to run a full newspaper column full of them. For the past five years, he's been working on questions that are just beginning to raise their head in Congress now. How market mechanisms can be created to permit trading in carbon, carbon allowances. More importantly, he has a pretty good idea of the winners and losers economically under a variety of cap and trade scenarios. He's served on the California State Market Advisory Committee, advising Mary Nichols' agency and the governor about how to design a cap and trade program. Mary Nichols, to his left, is currently the chairman of the California Air Resources Board, a job Governor Schwarzenegger appointed her to last July when she was happily and peacefully an academic at the UCLA Institute of the Environment, where she was director. She was remarkably well positioned to take over the agency, since she's come to air pollution regulation from almost all angles during her career. I don't know, your bio didn't say if you actually represented polluters, but uh, she graduated from Yale Law School and went to work in Los Angeles, suing to ensure federal and state regulators enforced the clean air laws. President Bill Clinton appointed her to head the Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Air and Radiation, where she midwifed the birth of the acid rain trading program, the first cap and trade program involving an air pollutant, and one that many people see as a possible model for a, uh, an upcoming carbon market. And with her EPA colleague, Margot Oge, she told me this once, which just goes to show you should never tell a reporter anything you don't want to hear. <laughs> she took great pride in being part of a two-woman regulatory team that dealt with the insides of the engines of cars and trucks, and a lot of male engineers had to deal with these two strong, smart women worrying about the toys that they were used to thinking of as boys play things. <laughs> Diane Greenick is the commissioner of the California Public Utilities Commission, where she's been efficiently ensuring that the state remains a national leader in energy efficiency. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this graph, probably a lot of you are, but there is their trademark graph, in fact, they ought to probably make it their logo for their agency, shows the per capita energy use in California and the per capita, per capita energy use in the United States over a period of about 35 years, starting around 1965. And California's goes like this. 
and the United States per capita energy use goes like that. And that's because of the work that Diane's agency has done. She knows her way around the electrical power grid and can tell you how much renewable energy can come online and how fast and give you some idea of what that will mean for your energy bills. She can also explain decoupling, the revolutionary move made by then Governor Jerry Brown in 1982 to ensure that utilities could make a healthy profit by selling less electricity. And I hope she'll tell us where the decoupling process may go from here. She also serves on Governor Schwarzenegger's climate action team and works on the leadership council of the US-China Energy Efficiency Alliance. Mayor Gavin Newsom doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. His work on his city's homelessness problem has gotten him national attention. His decision to officiate at gay marriage has garnered even more national attention. And I don't know if you were there, but I think the state Supreme Court today just yeah. finished hearing arguments yeah. on the issue. Yeah. He can already claim the honor of being the youngest ever mayor of San Francisco, but he's working on another goal, being the city's greenest ever mayor. City buildings and city vehicles are changing as the result of his administration's initiatives. Perhaps most importantly, building standards are changing, and once obscure terms like R values for insulation and PV, you all know PV, right, for photovoltaic sales that you put on your roofs, are, part of, are becoming part of everyday vocabulary in San Francisco and around California. But it hasn't been easy. And Mayor Newsom, I'd like to direct my first question to you. <laughs> what is the single least? I feel like Hillary Clinton. I wasn't. <laughs> yeah, sorry. You want a pillow? <laughs> <laughs> what is the single least sustainable area in American life and in the lives of San Francisco citizens? The least sustainable. Well, first of all, here's the perfunctory. Thank you very much for the question. <laughs> Welcome and thank you for this opportunity to be here. And uh, I do appreciate the opportunity uh, in this setting in particular to talk about some practical applications of the ideals that we're all trying to advance. There's nothing now more frustrating to me uh, as a citizen of this great region and as one of its elected officials than a lot of the rhetoric uh, around this green movement and a lot of the enthusiasm that hasn't necessarily translated into real action. Uh, it seems to me there's a conference going on every single day in every other part of the country uh, where everyone is announcing their latest initiative. What has not taken shape, and perhaps this is an indirect answer to the question, is an objective analysis of what has been actually accomplished and whether or not that could go to scale and it could be replicated elsewhere. If we're going to talk about cap and trade, if we're going to talk about the issues of carbon offset funds, we're going to talk about implementing some of these local global climate action plans to roll back CO2 emissions like our own 20% below 1990 levels by 2012, we've got to be able to measure those emissions, and not just municipal emissions. We tend to talk so much about our buses and our own municipal buildings, which are de minimis compared to the old, old overall CO2 outbook. Uh, we really have to have the independence and the veracity of the data uh, to create, create some strategy so we know whether or not we're actually producing any real results. AB 32 will not work unless we can do that. And so for me, it's just the whole idea of accountability and transparency that to me is the greatest enemy of this momentum and movement and energy and passion around this issue. Uh, and that's, as mayor, my number one job is to demonstrate the capacity to do, uh, not just to dream on the issue of the environment and the issue of governing a direction for sustainability. Okay. Mary, transportation accounts for 38% of California's greenhouse gas emissions. The number of miles that people travel in their cars goes up something like 3% every year. The state has already produced one answer to this, the Pavle Law. Washington has produced an answer to the state, which is, no. you think you can control greenhouse <laughs> gas emissions that come from cars? No. Yeah. So what are you doing now with this being probably the single biggest issue that you have to grapple with in terms of uh, reducing the state's carbon footprint? What are you doing now? What's possible in achieving reductions from cars? Well, as your question indicates, um, 
it's not just the cars because um, if the driving is growing at one and a half times the rate of the number of cars or the rate of the population, clearly we've got to do something to address the vehicle miles traveled. Um, it's really a three-part problem. It is the vehicles themselves, it's the fuels or the vehicle fuel combination, and it's the uh, way in which we use those vehicles. And uh, if we're going to address the growth issue, much less reduce to where we need to go, we've got to tackle all three, we've got to tackle them all simultaneously. Uh, EPA's denial of our waiver to enforce the PAVLI standards, which were meant to get us um, to about a third of the current emissions of our vehicle fleet, uh, is a temporary setback. We're going to win that one, either in the courts or with a new administration, just a race as to which of them comes first, and we'll move on with that program. Um, we have a low carbon fuel standard, which is uh, currently an idea, but is about to become a regulation, which is going to drive the fuel mix in California towards less petroleum and less carbon emissions, even with conventional vehicles. Um, and we are finally, uh, seriously, I would say, talking about, if not yet implementing or not yet consistently implementing at the state level, um, some policies designed to try to get the regions and the local governments, which are the land use agencies in California, to look at what their decisions mean for transportation. Um, here uh, in Mayor Newsom's territory, um, we know that the local government and the Metropolitan Planning Organization, the transportation planning agencies, want us to do more at the state level to be pushing our investments in the direction of things that are sustainable. Um, unfortunately, the myriad of different pots of money that we have, the different programs we have, um, work in a lot of directions that are not supportive of those goals. And we've got to find ways to align those things. It is going to take an effort of uh, interagency coordination and cooperation, unlike anything we've ever uh, succeeded in doing before. But um, climate makes us do things that other, uh, other things haven't. So um, we're going to start down that path. And maybe you can persuade private homeowners associations to allow photovoltaic sales on people's roofs. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, Larry, to promote sustainability, how important is it for government policy to establish a price on emissions, and does it matter whether that price is imposed through a tax or through a cap-and-trade system? Well, in the last panel, we talked a lot about behavioral change, and uh, I think a lot of the focus as to how to get behavioral change was by changing individuals' preferences or values bringing about a better ethic among consumers. As uh, Jim Sweeney mentioned, there seems to be developing a corporate ethic as well, that even if you're not faced with a penalty, you want to do right by the environment. And I think this idea of value change or changing people's psychologies is very important. But I would argue that there's another way that's just as important, and that is to try to create the right incentives for behavioral change. And that can either come through traditional regulation or it can come through more flexible policies such as cap and trade, which establishes a price on carbon, or a carbon tax, which puts a price on it directly, and similarly through either pollution taxes of other kinds. Um, I think that both are very important, uh, both the direct regulation approach and the price approach, but to get directly to your question, there's a particular advantage, I think, of using a price on carbon, and that is that it encourages the least cost approaches to reducing emissions. It's a way of doing it, it works as the following way. If, if you are an emitter, but you can find a particularly low cost way of reducing your emissions, then you're likely to sell a lot of your carbon allowances and do even, even more emissions reduction because the amount that you get from the sale will exceed <laughs> the cost of undertaking further reductions. Whereas those entities for which it's especially costly <laughs> to reduce emissions, they'll find it advantageous to purchase emissions allowances rather than to suffer these very, very high costs of reducing emissions. But through these trades, the total amount of emissions doesn't change. It's just for every buyer, there's a seller, so the total amount of allowances or emissions permits doesn't change. But what this price has done is it's encouraged uh, the emissions reductions where it can be done at the lowest cost to society. And there's a number of theoretical pieces, and there's, there's also a lot of empirical evidence that where we've seen prices put on, on pollution, we've been able to get reductions at lower cost than under conventional regulation. That said, 
I would say that there still is a place for conventional regulation. In certain cases, a uh, pricing system won't work or it should be done along with. But uh, there is a real advantage in terms of keeping the cost down. So one thing I would emphasize finally is that this approach to behavioral change, which comes through, let's say, the green voter, to put policies in place that provide incentives, I think is just as important as encouraging psychological change or enc encouraging the green consumer or the green corporate manager. The book that's called, you know, 50 Things You Could Do to Save the Earth really focuses on the green consumer or the gr green manager. But I think really one of the, the 50 first thing that you can do that I think would be equally important is to introduce public policies that provide incentives toward low cost reductions. To make it pay. To make it pay. Mm -hmm. Diane, you've dealt, uh, spent a lot of your career dealing with energy efficiency. What, you may have started that uh, when you were living here as an undergraduate, <laughs> just to keep the bills down. <laughs> if it's such a great idea, energy efficiency, if everybody can get behind it, why do we need government subsidies? Why isn't it just as Larry said, if you make it pay, it's in everybody's interest. Why do we need to support this uh, with government subsidy? Well, let me start off with um, when I was here and uh, it was over three decades ago. So I will say that it's just great to see the exuberance and it probably doesn't happen anymore, but there used to be movies shown here. Sunday nights. <laughs> I really date myself. I was one of the first uh, graduates out of the human biology. So um, I just want to tell all of you, live to your passion. Whatever it is that's really going to drive you with all of us here, um, go out and do it. Because if there's one thing we need um, to save us all from climate change, it's, it's passionate people. Um, unfortunately, back when I was here 30 years ago, Nobody, I can't even remember thinking about energy efficiency. I then went on to law school back at Georgetown, and the one and only course that was taught back then was oil and gas exploration. <laughs> that was the universe <laughs> when one thought um, about energy. And luckily, we've come much further. What somebody told me um, a about a month ago was that we have basically a generation, and that's frankly us, but we're the old folks. Uh, not you so much, but you know. <laughs> you're the, you know, most of you are the younger people. We have one generation to make carbon basically as valuable, carbon reductions as valuable as money. And that's something that is going to take everybody's efforts. So the question is, there isn't anybody who's thought about energy efficiency, I think, and understands it on some level that doesn't say, that's the first thing you do. That's the no regrets policy. Because when you reduce your usage, you save money and you're reducing carbon. Okay, why aren't we doing it? And even before we became aware of the need to act on climate change, we knew it made sense to do energy efficiency just to save money. There are thousands of studies that show this, yet when you look at what's happening nationally, when you look at what's happening internationally, energy efficiency isn't being tapped anywhere near it needs to be. And even in, in California, where we're running the world's largest, most comprehensive programs on energy efficiency, we know we haven't even tapped 50% of where we can go. What's wrong? Um, there are studies after studies that show there's something that's called market barriers, that just because um, it may be economically making sense over the life cycle of a widget, if there's a higher price the first time out, you won't necessarily buy it. You go into a store, you have a CFL that costs $7, you have an incandescent that costs, you know, a dollar, and do you really, at that moment in time, say, okay, I understand everything, I'm thinking about the carbon footprint, I'm, I'm making all these decisions, I'm doing the $7. How many people do that? You then multiply it. If you're a renter and you don't even get an electric bill, what is it that motivates you to say, I'm doing that $7 versus that $1? And, and that plays itself out um, all over every specter that we have. Um, I'll just quickly say for utilities, everywhere in the world where you have an investor-owned utility, and my agency regulates the investor-owned utilities, the Pacific Gas and Electric Companies of the world, 
everywhere in the world, the common practice is if you sell more electricity, you as a utility make more money. These are private investor-owned companies. The shareholders like that concept. They like it that the utility is making more money. We understand that. So you have to put in place mechanisms that say we're going to break the cycle so that if you don't sell more, you're not making more and you can sell less. You can have a sustainable way of doing things but still return profits to your shareholders. And, and there's so many ways that we look at this that we have to start dealing with, changing the whole paradigm of what is valued at every level. I'll hold that thought because I want to get back to decoupling and the future of decoupling. But a uh, question for Mary and for Mayor Newsom. How important is coordination with other states at this stage of the game? How important is coordination with other cities and municipalities? Is that, if you can coordinate, is that going to produce a template that the federal government could then pick up at a time of its choosing? Or are, is it going to be impossible to properly coordinate? Well, I'll start at the state level. Uh, we in California believe it is extremely important that we work with other states, other regions, and in fact, other countries on this problem. Um, global warming is in fact a global problem. As we know, we can learn from other people. Uh, but when the legislature passed AB 32 and told California to accept a carbon cap and to reduce our level of emissions, they told us to benchmark our efforts against what was going on elsewhere in the world. And they also uh, told us, I think, uh, very clearly, that they wanted us to go about reducing our carbon footprint as a state in a way that was beneficial to the state of California, not only to pick the most cost-effective approach, but also to look at this in a way that would actually benefit California. Um, as, since we are not an island, uh, we have to uh, look at the fact that a lot of our energy is imported, uh, whether from the north in the form of hydropower or from uh, the east in the form of coal-fired power or nuclear power. Uh, we have uh, products flowing into our state. We're a trading state. Uh, we export a lot of things as well. And for all of those reasons, um, we have to design a program that's scalable. We want to do things that are going to be attractive to other states. You mean something that's good for California will be good for Nevada or Oregon? Well, certainly with the western region where we share an electricity grid, it's extremely important because the electrons don't know what side of the border they're on. But as, uh, also <laughs> as citizens of a country that needs to be a signatory to a world system that can be enforceable at some level, we have got to come up with a program that will influence our national government to go along. Mayor Newsom. Yeah. This is very exciting time. I mean, first time in human history, a number of years ago, um, some new stats were presented that I think put this in perspective. First time in human history, more people on the planet now are living in urban centers than in rural and suburban areas. You got a million, million and a half people, and depends on the analysis or the latest report, a week that are moving into urban communities. 65% of America's population are in cities. Uh, we're consuming over 75, some would argue as high as 80% of the Earth's natural resources in those cities and polluting about an equivalent amount. So if you're going to get serious about climate change, you got to get serious about what's happening in the urban cores in our respective states and respective countries. Now there is the big idea. We don't need to wait for George Bush or whoever the heck's going to come in next to say, all right, Kyoto 2 or Bali 2, whatever the heck it is. We don't need to ask for permission. When they dropped out of the Kyoto Accords, we came up with that global, global climate action plan. We decided to go twice as far. And we're actually already below our 1990 levels, and we've been able to demonstratively measure that. That's a great start. But now it's about best practices and sharing ideas, and it's working with other cities. For example, I just was with a group this morning from Pasadena and Sam, uh, Santa Monica. We were in Oakland and uh, Berkeley and, uh, and in Marin County. We have a Green Cities Initiative, 10 of the biggest cities in the state of California. And we just came out with um, a strategy. I did an executive order and the other cities did ex executive order on recycling, 100% recycled paper. It's easy, low-hanging fruit, done. It's so easy as a pen to paper. They all agreed. Plug-in hybrids. To me, that's the big game changer. Going to get serious. Let's get these transportation plugged into the grid. We're doing an open order with all those cities. I'm going to bring it to the U.S. Conference of Mayors to get serious about plug-in hybrids uh, and try to create a market. We're working with Mayor Bloomberg, uh, where we came up. Love. He, he he was able. God love Mayor Bloomberg. He announced the taxi cab conversion initiative on the Today Show. I announced two years prior. 
that we were convert cabs on local cable channel 26. Um, and so it's clear which one you heard about. Um, but we're working together, the head of his taxi commission, on alternative vehicles for our taxi fleets as we begin to convert them. Uh, so these best practices are being shared everywhere. Every mayor in this country is jumping over one another to become the greenest mayor. And it's the greatest competition imaginable. And it's about sharing best practices. And so with respect, I love AB 32. I love it. <laughs> but I feel like we were there seven years ago in San Francisco. I mean, the idea of these cafe standards, Democrats patting themselves on the back, we're going to get up there 30, 32 miles. We'll eventually get where China is today in 10 years. You know, let's get serious here. I mean, it's time for real change, real leadership. So you ask me that question, I get passionate and animated. Uh, we're not waiting around. California is a leader, but we're not even close to where we need to be to get serious about this problem. And nor is San Francisco. And we're leading the way as a pace car, literally or figuratively, in many respects, relates to alternative fuel vehicles and biodiesel uh, and the like in these plug-in hybrids. But I feel like we're playing in the margin. That's why we're going to be doing a carbon tax. We're going to get serious about it. We're doing a lot on energy efficiency. You want to change the dynamic? That $7 investment's the best return on investment imaginable if I increase your utility user's tax. All of a sudden, now, it's not, that's a no-brainer. You've just substantially improved energy efficiency exponentially. I'm all for the carrot, but you do need to drive this from a public policy perspective at a certain point, and it's going to take cities. One way I want to do it, San Francisco wants to be there front and center. Well, Larry. <laughs> I'd like to respond to these recent comments in a couple of ways. Well, first of all, the fact that we're approaching climate policy at several levels, municipal, state, and even, believe it or not, at the national level, uh, that's both, I think, uh, a curse and a blessing. The curse part is uh, the coordination issue. And uh, I think uh, very diplomatically, Mayor Newsom indicated uh, that there's some potential uh, challenges in coordinating between the municipal level and the state level. And one in particular is this. To the extent that certain munis, municipalities go ahead of the state and achieve some big reductions early, it's very important that they not, in effect, be penalized for that at the time a statewide program goes in. That is, you want their allocations of emissions allowances under, let's say, a right. cap-and-trade program to be reflective of the fact that they've been good citizens, rather than to say, oh, San Francisco, per capita emissions are very low, let's give them just a few allowances. So that's, I think, a potential point of, uh, of concern uh, at the same time. I think Mary, who I believe has the hardest job in California because uh, the uh, AB 32 announced these targets, but didn't indicate at all how to get there. And she's got to make all the hard decisions. But uh, as far as I can tell, the Air Resources Board is very sensitive to this issue and is trying very hard to make sure that the allocations would be fair. There's also the issue of coordination with the feds. And if it turns out, and I think it may well turn out, uh, given the leading presidential candidates now, that under a new administration, uh, we have a climate bill with, with teeth in it passed within the first two years. Uh, there's going to be a real issue of coordinating with the kinds of state and regional policies that Mary has been talking about. And uh, California has always been a leader. San Francisco has been a leader as well. And there's really a sense in which uh, the, the, the national policy might not be as stringent or as strong as what California would like. And there's a delicate issue then of having California somehow be able to achieve deeper reductions and still reconcile that with a national program. If, uh, if you don't coordinate it, it will be an effect that what California does would, in effect, loosen the national cap and would end up subsidizing emissions reductions out of the state, and I don't think California wants that. So that's the curse side. That's the difficulty with coordination. But there's one very, very important uh, blessing, I think, f from the fact that we're moving to ever greater jurisdictional levels, from municipal to state to federal, and that is it helps eliminate the leakage problem, which is, prob which is one of the most severe problems that the states and cities face. Help if they me, take what's leakage? Leakage is the, re the phenomenon whereby uh, efforts to reduce emissions in some particular locality, say in California, raise costs in that locality and has the effect of causing industry to move out of the state so that you might have a reduction in emissions in the state as a result, but it's just counterbalanced by an increase outside of the state by the firms that relocate. Leakage can also occur if, it, if, for example, you raise the price of electricity in the state, then consumers of electricity end up buying more electricity that's generated out of the state. 
So you have reduction in in-state generation of electricity, but it's completely offset by an increase in out-of-state generation, which is obviously um, at odds with the spirit of, of the climate change policy. Leakage in many ways is very much reduced once you move to a national program, because then you don't have to worry in a sense, all the states are on a more even playing field, and there's less likely to be this exodus of firms out of one state or consumers making these choices. There's still a possibility of leakage across international borders, hopefully sometime in the more distant future, or not too distant future, one can move to a truly global policy, and that would deal with that problem as well. Well, Diane, you've already had experience in coordinating with the feds on energy efficiency issues, right? There's the Energy Star program at the federal level, there's the, the California program. Have there been frictions as a result of that, um, obviously there have. <laughs> <laughs> frictions what theme. frictions have there been as a result of that? And also, is the low-hanging fruit gone in energy efficiency at both the state and federal levels? Um, yes, there have been frictions. Um, let's take appliances. That we have a scheme, which certainly Mary is quite familiar with, where we look to the federal government. Uh, let me step back. It makes sense to just set some minimum standards of the efficiency of appliances that are sold that people buy. Um, I'm not an economist. Larry, you probably have some comeback that the market will sort itself <laughs> out. Um, but I'm on the regulator side of yeah. the uh, group here, which is for some things you just want to set the bottom line. And this gets back to what um, Mayor Newsom said is, frankly, we're behind China on yeah. a lot of these appliance standards. And that gets back to, under federal law, the federal government does set a lot of our appliance standards, and we're nowhere near where we need to be. We luckily have the ability in California to be able to set appliance standards where the federal government hasn't set the standard. But for years, we've had the problem that the federal government will start some bureaucratic rulemaking proceeding that then preempts us from being able to step up and get those standards in place. And meanwhile, we don't see the federal standards coming out of place. Um, I deal a lot on the national level, and I certainly think that we're going to be seeing, regardless of who the new administration is, a, a change. People understand um, energy efficiency is you know, bipartisan, that everybody can benefit from this. Let me get to your second question, which is, have we gotten rid of the low-hanging fruit? No way. We, we absolutely haven't. Um, What's the, left? Ma the majority of the states don't even have in place um, really serious building standards. We've had in California building standards for 30 years. We ratchet them up every three years when we get better technology, better experience. But you've got buildings being built everywhere in the United States, not to mention internationally, that, that aren't making use of really just the most basic technology. We're doing something really exciting here in California, I think, that this is probably, you know, who can say they're doing the most exciting things? We're all doing them. Yes. Um, but we adopted, um, California has now formally adopted as policy that we're going to be building what we call zero net energy buildings. And that is a concept that basically says when you put up new buildings, we can do it in a way that even with existing technology, we can cut the average energy usage about 40% from what your conventional building is. Um, if we put our efforts to it, we know we can develop technology beyond that. I hope all of you are going to be involved in those efforts. You know, we're looking for new technologies. That's the energy efficiency component. In California, we really go for energy efficiency first. But then after that, when you're thinking of building your building, let's put solar photovoltaics on those buildings. We can do a lot of other things so that basically you're trying to build buildings that use as little power as possible from what we call the central grid, the transmission system because that's where you get into the power plants and especially the coal plants where we drastically have to reduce it. And so we have this commitment for new homes in California to get them zero net energy by 2020. That came when I went to Europe this summer and discovered that the UK has that same goal to get there four years before California does it. And we said, if they can do it in 2016, give us another four years, we'll get there. And that's why we want to do it in San Francisco in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> it's, it's, just, it's just not that. I think we get so caught up in how difficult this stuff is. It's the easiest stuff in the world. I mean, look, I got a city with the lowest unemployment rate we've had in decades. We have the highest minimum wage. We haven't no leakage problems. It seems like every time we do, we get a flood of more people coming in because they love the value proposition. We have universal health care. A lot of these say, I'm not an economist either, so it's not to criticize the folks that are way above my pay grade. But there's enough anecdotal evidence to suggest I got more businesses moving in the more we do on um, the environment, not less. More businesses trying to participate because they recognize a workforce is being developed because people want to move there because it's about who they are as a person, uh, uh, that's their expression of who they are as individuals. So there's, a, there's a, the creativity index that Richard Florida talks about. But look, we did green building, municipal building standards have been around for years and they've been mostly on the municipal side and again started in cities, not necessarily states, with LEED certification when you build a new rec center or a library. We just became uh, the a city that is requiring it for all commercial and private residential as well as remodels. Because again, we're dealing with just a small percentage if we're gonna regulate our own municipal buildings and it's great that California's doing it, but it's that private sector that's gonna determine our fate and future. And so how do you get into those older buildings or when they remodel, how do you get into all these new constructed buildings that are going up certainly in the skyline in San Francisco? And ours is LEED Gold certification. Uh, which is getting pretty close. We've got some lead platinum buildings going up, our new Academy of Sciences, et cetera. But we're finally taking the steps necessary. Again, it's embarrassing when you go around the world. I mean, go into Berlin and look at their photovoltaic system. And you know, people say, San Francisco, too much fog. And I go to Berlin, I've never seen the sun in Berlin. <laughs> I haven't even read it in recorded history. There's been one sighting of the sun. And, and they got more, more solar than any city in, in the world. And, and Germany so far has, and the, the economy is doing quite fine in Germany. So I, I think I we just we got to start taking action. I love action. the competition. I love, <laughs> I love the competition between cities, and mayors are competing with each other for who has the greenest city. And it's a great thing because it's a value that will lead to more prosperities for their cities. And smart mayors have discovered that, and they are benchmarking themselves as well as sharing practices. And I can guarantee you that if Mayor Newsom were the governor, it would be about states, and if he were the treasurer, <laughs> well, it would be about yeah. treasurers, because Good that's point. the kind of person that gets attracted to these to these efforts. And it's we need it. I had the pleasure of, of going to Bali, or uh, it wasn't all pleasure, uh, <laughs> but it was an interesting experience to see both how stagnated things were at the international level and the incredible energy that was coming from the grassroots, from all the delegations that were there of businesses and non-governmental organizations with ideas and things that they are bursting uh, to do. But this issue that uh, this horrible term leakage may be a different way of, of uh, looking at it is to say that if Diane is successful and buildings are built that draw nothing from the grid, but all of the energy, uh, all of the materials in that building were built in China using machines and you know from factories that were all powered by Chinese coal, I don't think we would have made the globe a cleaner, safer place. And so we've got to think about life cycle emissions in a whole different way it, than we've ever had to do before. And that's why on top of all of this great competition and energy for what we can do locally, if we're not thinking at a truly global level, mm -hmm. we're not actually gonna save our planet. But I think it's wonderful that everybody here and presumably everybody in the audience is willing to sing Kumbaya along with us. <laughs> but I'm not sure all the businesses in California or in San Francisco would be singing the same tune. And Larry, could you tell us a little bit economically, how are businesses going to be brought along to see this wonderful new future and realize it's in their interest? Who are going to be the winners and losers and where are the fault lines going to be in the business community? I'm happy to answer that, but first I wonder if I could respond to something Please. that Diane said, which is I actually am in agreement with her, uh, despite our having different backgrounds. I think there's a big role for energy efficiency standards because of the other types of market failures that you, in, that you mentioned. Um, indeed, putting a price on emissions is one kind of regulation that deals with the market failure associated with the emissions themselves. But when you have sort of a disconnect between the interests of a tenant versus the interests of an owner, or if you have in uh, the auto market, the fact that in purchasing automobiles, individuals don't always calculate the true present value of savings, there are further problems that can be addressed through the kinds of direct regulation or efficiency standards. One of the most contentious issues that I think that uh, 
uh, arose at first when uh, cap and trade got floated as a possible uh, element of the arsenal of weapons to be used to deal with climate change in California, uh, some of the strongest opposition was by those who, f who felt um, threatened by these newfangled market approaches and felt there'd no longer be a role for other kinds of regulation. Indeed, You mean people on the left? More well, some, political. there was actually, a, uh, sorry to say, Mary, but I think there was a, some uh, concern as well within the Air Resources Board. That board, I think, traditionally has been a, a, a pace setter. It has, uh, has taken the lead in finding in, in coming up with new and innovative forms of conventional regulation, but I think there was some skepticism whether this uh, newfangled market approach would actually be useful and maybe it would displace conventional regulation. In fact, I think the two go hand in hand and convention, conventional regulation is often is needed for its own sake and in, in other ways it can help serve um, market mechanisms as well. So I don't think there has to be a conflict. But in terms of the business community concern, I think they have been concerned that uh, if you establish a cap on uh, emissions, a fixed cap. It may be very, very costly to meet that cap, and the prices could skyrocket, and they're very much worried about the uncertainty that that creates. They point to a, let's say, a cap and trade system with a checkered past, namely the Reclaim program in Los Angeles area, where at the time of the 2000 energy crisis, uh, there was a perfect storm of problems that uh, led to a, a huge spike in uh, this, the, the cost of emissions permits or emissions allowances. And the business community is very concerned that that could happen in California at the state level. There are ways of assuaging those kinds of concerns. In particular, you can introduce a kind of price ceiling on emissions allowances to give businesses some certainty that uh, prices will not go above a certain level. But I think it's inevitable that you're going to find many in the business community, not all, in fact, not necessarily a majority, but many, that are going to be concerned about the costs. And uh, at the same time, there's those in the environmental community that will think that whatever we're doing isn't enough, that the environmental problems aren't being sufficiently attacked. And I think it's important to get the word out that the cost need not be so great, and that cap and trade and other policies can actually achieve some significant reductions. So we're talking there about businesses having a problem with, uh, or a potential problem with dealing, uh, doing their normal kind of business under this new situation. But um, Mayor Newsom, Di Diane, is there some way to talk about the people who aren't in this edit auditorium, who don't really necessarily know what sustainability is or care what sustainability is, don't really have much sense of why energy efficiency is important? How do you reach people who aren't, you know, how do you preach to those who are not already in the choir? Um, we are doing a lot of thinking about that. that we have in California on energy efficiency a, a triage approach. One is um, get things in appliance standards, get things in building standards that make sense. Um, the second prong is the types of programs that my agency oversees, the billion dollars a year, utility programs where they're helping buy down the costs of that CFL where they're providing the assistance to a local government of you want to set up a really far-ranging program to be reaching not only the buildings within the local government, but within your community. But we're understanding more and more there's a third prong that frankly we haven't done a good enough job on. Um, it's the term we use on a technical basis is market and behavior transformation. And what this is about is, you know, really making it what we think about of a way of life. And I was um, uh, down in Cupertino this morning meeting with some folks um, uh, who are really thinking about the internet to understand how we could use it. And we were discussing, you know, many businesses don't even understand that there's even an energy question when you're making business decisions. So how do we then step back and say, okay, there's a world called energy efficiency, and then we say there's a world called carbon footprint, and they're all linked together, and you have to figure all this out. So we're, we don't have the answers, but we're starting to really say there's a huge element combined with the opportunities we have with AB 32 and climate change to do not just education, but really transformation. And the panel before us talked a lot about 
Um, I was so interested when they said with businesses that are stepping forward on sustainability, um, that they're looking at it can be a way that it's not just developing um, business products that they're able to then go out and market and make money, but they're able to engage their own employees to think about it and be part of it. We've committed um, that we're going to be launching in California basically a California energy efficiency branding effort starting next year to really start to galvanize and have people start to understand this. We're going to be launching um, a state-of-the-art energy efficiency web portal you know, using the brightest minds there are in Silicon Valley. We know the internet better than anybody else in the world. And that's how we can then really have interactive ways to be having people not just educated, but contributing to solutions. And, and I think it's all part of that, to start thinking about how we change just, and, and we don't change, how everybody changes, how they think about these issues and the solutions. Well, Mayor Newsom, there's somebody out there in the middle of the audience saying, Furious with wanting, wanting to say to you, so what is the sustainability thing? Why should yeah. I care? Yeah. What do you say to them? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I, well, I agree, by the way, with everything. And I mean, this, she's absolutely right in the education. By the way, we're going to all the schools. We've got a very comprehensive educational program. Worked, um, it, it's working um, very well on the recycling side. Uh, now, just the, look, you get a picture to a young child of a, a baby polar bear uh, struggling to get up on what's remaining of an ice flow. Uh, you've now changed their perspective of the environment and put it in perspective. And they say, well, what do I do to help? Uh, so I think you can be as brazen as that, but as nuanced as, and, and as thoughtful as was just being advanced. Uh, there's so many ways of looking at it. But one of the things, uh, look, it's a, it is about partnerships. It's about connections. It is about interdependence. It is about Cisco system recognizing that they can save millions and millions of dollars by teleconferencing, that it's in their best interest to reduce their CO2 output and emissions just by being smart about things and looking at information communication technology, ICT emissions, and looking at efficiencies and waste. It is about what is in the best interest of these businesses to become more energy efficient because they actually save money. Uh, and so we're looking for ways of working and partnering with those companies, literally and figuratively, uh, uh, John Chambers, we've got this new Muni bus that actually calculates your CO2 output on the bus in real time, and you can determine exactly <laughs> what your output is. Um, and just, again, it was $10,000 of technology. And this is one of the smartest buses anywhere in the world. Uh, that's all it costs, $10,000. And you can watch ride. it while you're riding? Watch you it while you're see. riding. So on all these the Sort of like those planes is where you are in the United States? It, so. Absolutely. And then you've got its free Wi-Fi, too, so you can tell all your friends how bad it is. And, you know, <laughs> um, but, you know, and we're working, you know, look, environmental defense and Fred Krupp, what he's doing in crap and trade, and he's got all these enlightened new businesses that now recognize greens, you know, the new gold, so to speak. And you've got folks out there, Tom Freeman is going to write his next world's flat, but it's going to be all about uh, uh, petropolitics and the issues of, of climate change and, and the economic imperatives and the opportunities. I, I don't think it's going to be that difficult. I think people get it. I think the average person really does get it. I, I was just in Texas yesterday, and people get it. I don't care where I am, they get it. Iowa, they get it. Nevada, they get it. They're, they've heard enough, they get it intellectually. But we've got to create the incentives. We've got to create the imperative. We've got to make it easier. Uh, you know, the way we do it with business, by the way, is on the carbon tax, we say, well, get rid of your payroll tax. They say, we're listening. You mean we can reduce our energy output, reduce our utility users' costs, save money, and I don't have to pay a payroll tax? So, yeah. They said, well, I'll bring it on. I'm ready to do it. Now, it may sound too, you know, the, you know econom economists say, oh, well, there's this. I don't know. But it sounds so far so good. I get nervous around you, Larry. But... I just, you know, there's just so many little things. And I just, I don't meet many people that don't get it. Heck, we're already on fluorescence. I just banned T12s. You can't get them in San Francisco. We're already on the next phase of fluorescence. And you just get T8s. That makes it easy. So everyone gets that. They just don't have a choice. Now, I mean, that's, you know, a little command and control, nanny. But, you know, I'm from San Francisco. Um, but, but, you know, people don't. I, I, my problem is with this whole issue is, again, I just, I was too much intellectualizing, not enough action. I just don't know. You know, I feel like I've been playing in the margins. There's nothing I can't do. We can come out, we've got a congestion pricing thing. We'll make New York and, Bar and, and London and even Singapore pale in comparison. That should certainly get me kicked out of office finally. Um, <laughs> but, it, but it just doesn't seem folks are just, they're ready to jump on board. And, and if it's not adults, it's going to be these kids because they all seem to get it. 
And so as much as I'm concerned about educating the average person about what sustainability is, uh, I think it's just an incredible tipping point in the last few years. And uh, you got the leaders up here that have led the way. And, and I just get to be there to help be their conduit to practically implement some of them. Well, then Mary and Larry, just to, again, to bring it down just a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, Mary, it's so wonderful where you take us. I don't want to be the one to bring it down. <laughs> okay, lift it up. Who are the losers? When the politics of climate change goes national, even when, when some of the regulations that uh, Larry might, not regulations, Larry, I'm sorry, some of the suggestions <laughs> that Larry's group might be making, some of the regulations he might be putting in are going to mean, let's say that a poor community, what if they could mean that a poor community would have to pay higher rates for their electricity and would have to pay higher electricity bills if Diane can't get their appliances more efficient? How do you deal with that at both a personal policy level and at a political level? Well, I think it's a big concern. Uh, I don't know what Mayor Newsom has done with all of his poor people, but in L.A., <laughs> where I'm from, we have a lot of poor people. Yeah. And uh, they're customers of our municipal utility, L.A. Department of Water and Power. And the L.A. Department of Water and Power, over the years, invested heavily in coal because it was a way to make sure that they could keep the lights on and, uh, you know, it was very, very good for the city ex if you didn't bother to take into account either the air pollution effects on the western states that got to um, uh, breathe the air or if you didn't have to worry about global warming. Now, of course, we're worried about global warming and the city is heavily invested, contractually invested, in giant baseload coal plants. So Which are based in Nevada, Arizona? Based in, uh, based in Utah, actually. Okay primarily. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to do? Well, the city's got to get out of the coal plant, right? But if they leave that coal plant going and just sell it off, which they could do today at a very handsome rate, um, that coal plant is not going to get shut down. That coal plant is going to keep on chugging away. It's just going to sell its energy to customers in Utah or other places nearby. So if we want to try to accelerate the phase down of generating from that plant, We've got to either come up with a technology that's going to capture all the emissions and bury them underground, which is still um, it's a thought, but probably <laughs> not, uh, not in the short term, uh, or we're going to have to find a way to shut that plant down faster than it would have otherwise and replace it with something else, which could include uh, efficiency as the number one goal to make the city much more efficient, and then um, other renewable options. Well, you start looking at the cost of those options, and it's doable if there's time, you know, if there's enough time to do it. And that's what the city really wants to do, is to be put on a path, given a, given a target, and told, go out there and, and meet that target. And then they, they will figure out a way to do it. What they're scared to death of, and again, this can be fixed with the system, but as they understand it now, with the cap and trade system, if everybody's under a cap and the allowances go based on where people should be versus where they are today, San Francisco, which enjoys a lot of very clean hydroelectric power, um, comes out looking great and people in LA are paying citizens of San Francisco now, and um, meanwhile that coal plant is still not getting cleaned up. So um, you have to come up with a system which takes into account the fact that there are poor people who, uh, by the way, also as the climate gets warmer, are gonna need, elect, uh, need some form of uh, air conditioning in the summertime, in the heat of the San Fernando Valley, even if they don't need it today. Um, you know, when we have a really bad hot period in the summer, um, people die, old people mm -hmm. die earlier than they should have because they didn't turn their air conditioning on because they couldn't afford to turn their air conditioning on. So these are issues that you've got to find a way to, <laughs> try, if you're in my position at least, you have to try to think about how to balance those things out. And what we're looking at is ways that you could take income from selling allowances or auctioning allowances and direct it towards alleviating some of these problems. But again, you, you gotta do it right. You can't just wave a, wave a wand and, and make it happen. Well, Larry, do you have a magic economic wand you can wave to make this happen? <laughs> yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> I must say I'm, I'm very flattered. Here, uh, Mayor Newsom faces angry stakeholder groups all the time. And yet what he really fears is an economist. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, uh, by the way, the scheme that you talked about, basically putting a charge on uh, pollution and using it to cut payroll taxes, 
is something that's uh, been very much pushed forward by academics and, and policy makers. It's, uh, and I think it's a really great idea. And uh, with that, we could uh, uh, green the tax system more and sort of substitute uh, taxes on bads for right. taxes on goods. Good. So, yeah. so I think that uh, that's not only a good idea, but I wish it were uh, had broader uh, currency. Um, in terms of um, the effects on low-income communities, uh, to start out, in the first panel, we talked about a lot of things that can be done essentially free. With a change of values, with a change of, act, of actions, uh, change of psychology, uh, people can do the right thing by the environment, and it's their own initiative. Uh, we, for example, don't have draconian policies that force people to recycle, but there's been a whole change in people's perceptions of recycling, and people do it. Uh, unfortunately, as your question suggests, uh, uh, if you couple uh, efforts to change values with regulations uh, or market-based approaches, uh, studies indicate that there will be some costs. Uh, the economic models are all over the map, but uh, uh, most of them indicate that there will be some costs. So it's not a free lunch, but the good news is that uh, all of the models say that uh, the lunch is worth paying for, that the environmental benefits are of much greater value than the sacrifices. So what do you do then when some of the costs would be borne by uh, low-income uh, households who spend a disproportional share of their income on energy-related services such as home heating or transportation? Well, I think Mary already mentioned, I think, a key thing, and that is that uh, if you introduce a cap-and-trade system, uh, there's a lot of uh, theoretical work and, and indeed some empirical findings that suggest that you could auction a great percentage of the allowances you only need to give a certain fr small amount out free without doing harm to the economy. And that, that could bring in a lot of revenues. It could bring in close to a billion dollars of revenues to the state of California. And much of that revenue could be directed to providing income relief to low-income uh, communities. I should, perhaps should mention in this regard that just, I think it was last week, uh, the environmental justice movement of California came out with a great deal of publicity with a statement that cap and trade has no place in, among, in the toolkit of policies being used in California on the grounds that it would disproportionately hurt uh, low-income communities. I, I feel bad about that because I think that that's uh, based on a misconception. Uh, there's lots of evidence now that uh, these market approaches actually reduce the price increase that would come under uh, pollution emissions reductions compared to more conventional regulations. Uh, so, on the one hand, it's less of an impact on energy prices, and moreover, it can bring in revenues that can be used to undo whatever impact remains. Now, it's no panacea. It's hard to reach every, each and every individual that's affected. Um, you can't always cut payroll taxes when some of the poor don't pay payroll taxes. But there are other ways, perhaps by f subsidizing public transit or other goods and services that, that low-income individuals make high use of. So, I don't think there's any way of making it uh, of eliminating the pain for everyone, but I think there are ways of eliminating a lot of the pain. And if you consider the, the alternative, which is to not do something, we're talking about a lot of pain in the future. So it's, I think, one of these choices that should be made. Thank you. I think at this point, it's time to turn it over to audience questions, assuming there, there's some out there. So please, raise your hands. Yes, there, in the blue shirt. I think it's blue. The subject of but it actually concerns me a lot that we haven't heard a really serious discussion of this. And Larry will know that I've asked him this question before. I'm worried that, 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 cap, that the caps that are accompanied by giving out permits um, are certainly becoming less popular, but that Larry's still talking about that. I don't understand the merit of it, but if we were to get rid of it and had only cap and auction, that is, all the, cap, all the permits were auctioned, and with revenue to the state that could be used, the state or the municipality or the federal government, that could be used as Larry was just describing, that I'm not sure I see the benefits of cap and trade over uh, a carbon tax. Moreover, a carbon tax guarantees a price, and though it doesn't cap the total amount of emissions, it controls uh, the costs and the volatility, making it much easier to make those marginal investments that are needed. So I'd really I like to hear each of the panelists talk about carbon taxes which I think, though politically difficult, are much more important. Mary? Well, well I'll start. start. I'll, sure, why not? Um, 
We are, uh, at this point, at the state level, looking at a series of options that we're actually trying to model um, sort of in broad sets of, of policies that could be used to meet the goals of, of AB 32. And we are using carbon fees or carbon taxes as one of the options that we will model uh, for cost and for effectiveness. So it will be part of the part of the discussion going forward leading towards a scoping plan recommendation at the end of this year. Um, it's interesting that when I first started uh, in this job last July, um, many people told me that the topic of carbon taxes or carbon fees simply was not mentionable. Mm -hmm. Given the high degree of uh, difficulty there is in California in raising taxes in any way, shape, or form, um, all of the burdens, uh, the two-thirds vote in the legislature, just for starters, mm -hmm. that you couldn't do it at the state level, even if the goal was to you know, raise revenue that could be used to reduce other taxes, which is one of the, one of the best ideas for what to do about it. That there, it was just a non-starter. What's begun to happen in my um, uh, travels around the state and talking to people is that as people begin to understand more about cap and trade, uh, that it isn't a free lunch, that not everybody makes money off of it, <laughs> that there is uncertainty, um, you know, that you still have to reduce carbon, it's not a static uh, situation, the number of allowances has to go down every year, um, they start to think well, gee, maybe a tax would be better because maybe I, if I'm a business, would have more choices, flexibility in terms of how I choose to change my behavior uh, versus under the cap and trade system where I've got to hire somebody to go out and figure out this whole new allowances thing. You know, we know how to deal with taxes. So it's very interesting to see some in the business community and the environmental justice groups, as, as Larry mentioned, sort of coming together and suddenly carbon taxes are their favorite uh, tool. I, I think uh, in the case of some of the groups that are promoting it now, maybe there's a little bit of mischief in it in the <laughs> sense that they think that nothing will happen because it'll just delay you know, any kind of action further. But I think it's something we have to look at. And as, as other people have suggested, I don't think there's going to be a one-size answer to all of this. I think we're going to probably end up with some type of a carbon fee and some regulations and a cap and trade system at the end of the day. I want to respect the question is wishes that he hear from everybody, but I also want to get in other questions. So sure. could I ask the three of you to answer very briefly, please? I'm sorry, but there need to be other questions, too. I'll just offer a brief uh, answer, which is one, there's a matter of perception that a tax is the T word and no one likes tax, whereas under cap and trade, it wasn't as apparent, at least initially, that in effect that's still charging a price. And one way that they are similar is that uh, under a tax, you set the price, that's the tax rate, and the quantity of emissions ends up being determined by the market. It's just the reverse under cap and trade. You set the quantity of emissions that's allowed and the market determines the price. So depending on which you want to know first and which you would rather have less uncertainty about, you might prefer one over the other. And your comment was correct that uh, if you auction allowances, then it's like having a tax as well. But again, the price at which the allowances are auctioned is determined by the market under a cap and trade system. So I think they're very similar. And uh, frankly, I think there's a lot to be gained by either one. I hope that the, the move toward a, 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 a national climate policy with significant uh, teeth in it doesn't get bogged down in the debate between taxes versus emissions allowance systems. I think uh, either one would be a major step forward. Diane. Um, I'll just repeat <coughs> that as well. There's, there's lots, the more that I'm in public policy, the more I'm convinced, there's lots of different ways to get to the end game. The, the point is, are you focused on what the end game is? And as the mayor said, are you rigorous about measuring are you there? And frankly, are there penalties if you don't get there? So I think that um, the debate really does need to be, are we getting on board that we're gonna get there? Are we doing the measurement to make sure we're there? Frankly, are there gonna be penalties um, or ways that we make sure we get there? And then we will be evolving over time which of the methods we use, that it is very complicated. It's not just national, it's international. Um, so there isn't, in my mind, one right answer, um, but it really is what's the end point and make sure we're, we're focused very much no matter what structure we take to get there on getting to the end point. Yeah, and, and again, let me, maybe it's because my Santa Clara education, not Stanford, <laughs> carbon bad, payroll, um, 
uh, <laughs> payroll uh, and jobs good. So why you charge, as Larry said, why you tax a good thing, jobs, but don't tax a bad thing, pollution is beyond me. So I have a mechanism. I collect payroll tax, goes to the treasurer's office, simple accounts, been happening for years. I've got this utility user's tax, commercial utilities user tax that we're focusing on first, and we collect that. We increase the commercial utilities tax, we generate more money. At the end of the day, we say how much money we generate, we go rebate, and we return an equivalent amount to everybody pro rata. Pretty simple. I have a, again, I'm just confused by the confusion. Uh, I'm going to start there, and then you get, we can, I, I've been, I was just in Davos, the world economic, I had all these experts, and, and I, I was just, after 40 minutes uh, with all these smart folks on, on, on cap and trade, I figured one day someone will figure that one out. In the interim, though, just the good and the bad, the simple payroll tax, carbon tax, we want to be the first city to do it, and then we can fail, and you can all say what a, you know, outrage that is, and you can say, maybe it worked, maybe components worked, maybe it'll make it easier job for Mary to say, hey, uh, no way over our dead body, look what it did to San Francisco, or hey, maybe it wasn't so bad, uh, and it's really not a tax, it's revenue neutral, it's a way of actually assessing real cost uh, benefits. Recently, the, uh, the energy law that, that we were trying to pass in California to um, take oil fees and, and divert that to alternative energy. Is there a chance, an opportunity to overturn that and so that, so that it does go to alternative energy development? And also, what's the name of the website for, um, for inputting energy efficiency, energy efficiency ideas? ideas? Mary, can, or I, Diane? I, 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 I thought you said you question, had a... I think, but I didn't understand the second. I'm sorry. I thought... I thought you said you cr we were creating a re website where people could participate in, 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 in ideas for energy efficiencies. No. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, there's it a, is, okay. okay, so uh, on the first one, there was a, an initiative that was put on the ballot that was designed to uh, increase California's oil extraction fee. This is a fee that's paid for the oil that we actually produce in California, of which there's more than most people realize, and then and take that money and use it for energy uh, good things, mainly renewable energy. Um, and it was defeated pretty resoundingly at the ballot box because the oil companies ran a very effective campaign that convinced people that it would raise the price of gasoline. Um, I think it's important while we're all patting ourselves on the back about how uh, we're all convinced that climate change is real and that we're ready to do something about it, to understand that people do not react um, to an increase in the price of gasoline as if that was a good thing and they were contributing towards making the planet a better place. <laughs> the majority of our fellow citizens out there are people who are uh, quite dependent on their cars and who count the price of gasoline. Middle class people as well as working class people pay attention when the price of gasoline goes up a penny or two and they don't like it. So without having alternatives uh, out there and um, a public education campaign, yes, but a lot of other things along with it. Um, I don't think we get there uh, by just assuming that we can raise people's gasoline prices. So I would not be optimistic about that type of an initiative passing at the ballot box. Um, I think you can sometimes get away with increasing the price of things if people know that the, exactly where the money is going to go and they believe that it's for something that they voted for and that they want. But it's a hard, it's a hard row to hoe, especially if you're going to do it at the ballot box. Yeah. But, Other oh, I'm sorry. You know, I, I mean, oil companies, God bless them, and they've been struggling the last few years, so I want to be sensitive. <laughs> um, they put more money to defeat that than the entire Clinton uh, campaign cost in 1992. And it wasn't a particularly well-drafted piece of legislation, candidly. And if we had tweaked it a little bit, it would have passed. And uh, the argument that it was going to increase gas price, I just, I, I don't want to get into that debate, but I feel very intense about that. Uh, but I also feel very intense that I agree uh, absolutely, Mary, with you that, that the first response is, no, I don't want to pay more at the pump. But I'll tell you, I've seen some polling and I've seen some real data suggest if there is a direct cause and effect, a direct correlation that's quantifiable, countable, and transparent, that there may be a willingness. And the reason I say that is not without consideration because local government can actually do this. City and county like San Francisco can. So I've looked at it. Now this is really, potentially, you're right, a major pratfall politically. 
But if principally you believe it can have a direct impact and you can deal with the issue of a aggressive tax and you can address the issue of income inequality, and, and then I think it's worth considering, though I don't think that was the intention ever of that oil extraction fee that, by the way, exists in almost every other state but not the state of California. Thank you. Now, emission regulations are important, but I think to some extent they obscure the discussion about higher density land uses is right now San Franciscans use a lot less energy per capita than the rest of the state, so, but San Francisco is not getting any bigger. So how do you go about encouraging more walkable places over more sprawl, I guess? You driven in the city, well, walked or biked or uh, trained into the city and seen some of those new towers are going up. We're, we're just going straight up. That's what's happening in cities, sort of the Vancouverization of urban centers. Um, you're seeing a lot of density focus on uh, land use that substantially deals with sprawl issues and quality of life and green building standards. We actually incentivize it, so we'll actually fast track permits uh, to get the permits in the front of the queue. Uh, and the, the time value of money is such that these come, everybody, we actually have a bigger line now for permits to get ahead of the line uh, on green building standards than in the regular line, because everyone's jumping at them. Uh, but that's exactly how we're addressing them. I mean, suburban sprawl, that it just, you know, it's, it's like the whole issue, it, you know, for me on the, on the high-speed rail in the state of California, you're going to get serious about EB32 and environmental stewardship, and you're going to be opposed to a, a high-speed rail, and then I'm just utterly confused by priorities. You can't build enough freeways. You're not going to build enough airport runways, environmentally or otherwise, to get yourself out of a growing population. You've got to provide alternatives, and certainly high-speed rail makes that a lot of, heck of a lot of sense, excuse me, um, uh, uh, to me. Uh, and then smart land use. And I think all of us are coming, even... I mean, Democratic states, Republicans, that's a, a, a non-ideological issue. The smart growth is, is now, I think, the norm. It's not the extreme. One, One more, more quick question, since I neglected that side of the room. Yeah, I just had a question about sprawl, um, particularly because so many working class families are moving out of cities because they can't afford to live there anymore, and then that increases our transportation emissions. So just driving out of the Bay Area, of course, you just continue to see more and more um, areas cropping up. So what's being done at the state level, a uh, question for Mary, uh, to reduce sprawl? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, the, your question is correct that um, this is not a problem that can be solved by one city. Um, if we're going to have uh, incentives for densification, which hopefully will benefit urban core areas, but we're also going to have to redevelop older suburbs. I mean, densification is now the norm in a lot of what once were considered uh, sprawling suburbs as well. But in terms of the land use and transportation uh, connection, it has to be done at the regional level, not, a, not a, by any one individual locality. And that is the state's responsibility to help strengthen those regional plans. Mm -hmm. Now we've got every region in the state developing blueprints with preferred alternatives for what kind of growth scenarios yeah. they want to see right. happening. And what we need to do at the state level, I think, is to put our money where our mouths are and make sure that we have real incentives for those areas that are following. Uh, it's the toughest thing in the world for the local um, uh, people who have to actually uh, grant permits is to say no to a development on the fringe, um, even if it's going to uh, cause there to have to be more money spent on roads to get there and more congestion and everything else. Yeah. If that development is going to bring in tax revenue that they need, they're going to have a hard time saying no. And so we're going to have to either provide countervailing um, positive incentives or come up with, a, with some uh, penalties as well for not, not sticking to those growth scenarios. And that includes, as uh, I think it, I forget it was, who it was who mentioned it earlier, but you know, facing down the local uh, neighbors at a time when density is what's um, at stake, and you do have to say sorry, but you know we're going to have growth in your neighborhood where you already live, and that uh, new building down the street is something that we need to make this whole community workable. I come from Los Angeles, which is one of the places that's fought density the hardest. Mm -hmm. But as congestion gets worse, um, people are actually beginning to see that um, you can uh, make it possible for there to be transit development around areas where you have allowed for there to be mixed-use development and more walkable communities, and you don't have to sacrifice the nicer, you know, um, dream homes for with the lawns and you know single-family houses that that um, once characterized the uh, the California dream. But that isn't the right house for you know 
couples with grown up kids or you know families of two or one or whatever that we can have choices and it doesn't have to make the community a less attractive or uh, desirable place to live but that takes a lot of visioning and then some some real um, uh, I would, I'm not sure I'd call it enforcement, but serious <laughs> tools, 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 that that's right. tools that we don't use right now. Um, well, I, I, have just, to. I just wanted to, to very quickly add this issue is a huge one internationally as well. Mm -hmm. um, everywhere in, well I shouldn't say everywhere in California, many, many places in California, we have done an abysmal job of the whole conundrum of transportation and land use. And um, one of the statistics that I've learned recently that just sticks in my mind is in China, at the rate they're building commercial buildings now, every three years they are building as much commercial space as in the entire United States. And this is where we're all looking at that we have to take this, the small steps we're doing, even though everyone says they're big steps, to a scale that has never been done before. And I, and I bring this up just because um, in China, it is not that they are particularly building the 5,000 square feet McHouses, though, you know, at some point that is going to be what's going to become, you know, the thing to do. But what they are not grappling with is the transportation issue. And this is where we aren't a leader nope. for the most part. We don't have good lessons. And this is not just going to be an issue for California to deal with, but internationally, and particularly in China, what is going to be the solution on transportation? And I think on that note, uh, we're running a little bit over our time. Forgive me. I'm afraid we're going to have to stop the questioning there. I'd re I've really enjoyed this. I'd like to thank, thank the you. panelists thank uh, who have just been great. Gavin Newsom, Diane Greenick, Mary Nichols, Larry Goulder. Thank, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that was wonderful. I'd, I'd just like to ask your indulgence for a short 30 seconds more. I think as many of you realize, this is not an easy um, event to pull off, and a lot of people spent an, a, a lot of time and, and gave a lot of the, the uh, passionate effort into pulling this off. So let me just read the list. It is, uh, it'll take about uh, 35 minutes, but um, first of all, from the Energy Crossroads, the student, many students, but particularly Marissa Choi, Drew Bennett, Amanda Mitchell, Sanjana Tandon uh, spent uh, a lot of time working on this. A lot of people from Stanford staff from all over the campus, and I'm probably gonna forget someone here, but let me just mention the names. Uh, Todd Logan, Brenda Pasquale, Tom Bauer, Jonathan Rabinovitz, Jean McCowan, Mark Schwartz, Keith Iverson, Lee Johnson, Daphne Stewart, Ogenev and Vainen, and Elaine Enos. And finally, I want to recognize a group of uh, graduate students who held a conference this morning called the Young Environmental Scholars Conference, and they'll be continuing tomorrow. They uh, spent some time here this afternoon as well, and, and the organizers, Hilary Schaefer and Lauren Hartzell. So please join me in thanking all those people. people. <clears throat> so to the... Uh, the panelists from the uh, earlier panelists, Jim Sweeney and, and uh, Christina Page, Peter Williams and, and uh, Joe Stagner, and then Mayor John Stewart, I mean Gavin Newsom, uh, <laughs> Commissioner Greenwich, Professors Nichols and Goulder, and, and Felicity, Felicity Barringer, thank you very much. Uh, I wish you all a very pleasant uh, rest of a wonderful California afternoon, and please, walk home safely. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.